This is our last Sunday in Mad World, Living Sane in a Crazy World. Has anyone like enjoyed this series or felt like it's at least been appropriate? Um, and so we're, we're going to close it out today. And I, as I was thinking about like how to close this out, um, I remembered that a while ago I had this problem and it got me thinking, I wonder if anyone else has ever had this problem. And here's, here's a problem that I've had. And I was wondering maybe if you had this problem. Have you ever had the problem of, you know what you wanted something to look like? Like you, you could see it, you know where you wanted to go, but you you didn't know how to get there. Like you could see the goal, you could see the result, but you didn't know what steps or practices w would get you there. Um, has, has that, raise your hand if that's, ever, if that's ever been you. Okay, so there's a few of out there. The rest of you, you might be lying. I don't know. Um, so anyway, like this, this happened to me. Um, and here's what happened. Um, way back, I got, I got sick. I got sick years and years ago. Um, really sick, so sick that I had to go to the hospital. Um, I lost a bunch of weight. I was really, really healthy and I lost a bunch of weight. I went down to about 130. Um, and it took me a couple years to get better. Um, but after I got better, I had a really hard time um, getting kind of physically fit and kind of keeping weight on my bones. See, I'm almost 5'11", and I could barely reach 150 pounds. And I don't know if you know what it's like to be a guy and look like a scarecrow. That really wasn't the look I was going for. Um, and I'd often say, listen, guys I, and girls, I go to the gym. Like, I put effort in, and yet I still look like this. And it was very frustrating to go to the gym, work out, you know, put a lot of effort in, and not be able to put on some weight, not be able to be kind of physically fit the way that I was. Was. And so you know what I did? I got tired because here's what, I knew what I wanted to look like. I knew that I wanted a little bit of weight. I wanted to be stronger. You know, I, I don't need to be Arnold Schwarzenegger. I just want to be healthy for, for my age, for, for my height. I just, that's what I wanted. But it, listen, I even did all the stuff that the other guys in the gym do. I watched their workouts. I did it. I, I tried to grunt the way that they did and yell at the weights. And you know, um, I never wore the mankini that a lot of them wear because it didn't look good on me, right? You know? Um, and so like, it just didn't work. And then I decided, you know what I'm going to do? I, I'm, and so here's what I did. I said, I'm tired of this. I'm putting all this effort in it. I'm not getting the results. So I hired a coach. And I didn't just hire any coach because you know what? There are a lot of people who say that they can coach you, but they can't do the thing that you want to do. And if you can't do the thing that I want to do, then I don't want you to coach me on that thing because you, you should be able to, like, can I get an amen from somebody in the crowd, right? So I did a bunch of research and I found this coach um, that could help me. And so this coach gave me a bunch of practices. This coach came up with this plan and gave me a bunch of practices and steps to follow. And so in the last almost year, about nine to 10 months, I've been following these practices that my coach gave me. And I've put on almost 15 pounds of muscle. Um, you don't have to, like, it's okay. I, I know I was skinny and it's okay. I just want to be healthy. Put in 15 pounds of muscles and between my squat, my bench, and my deadlift, I've added 150 pounds to my total. And so like, I've moved forward, which I'm pretty pumped. You don't have to be pumped about it, but I'm excited. I'm finally getting to where I want to be because my coach gave me practices that I didn't know to do. I could see where I wanted to go, but I didn't know how to get there. And it got me thinking, have you ever seen where you want to be? but you don't know the practices or the things that will lead, to, lead you to where it is that you want to go? And it got me thinking, do you remember middle school? Come on, anybody back remember the middle school? Some of you were like, I'm trying to forget middle school. Please don't ask me to remember middle school, right? Like, so you remember back in middle school, you wanted to be popular and you wanted to be cool. And the problem is you didn't know the right things to do that would make you cool and popular. And sometimes you did things, but they made you uncool and unpopular. And you're like, I know what it is that I want to be, but somehow I don't know what it is that will lead me there. Maybe it was in high school. Maybe in high school it was on a team. Or, or maybe you wanted to be the first chair in the band. And so you practice, you know, you practice whatever instrument it was, it was, and you tried to be nice to the teacher, but for some reason, you could never get to the first chair. You didn't know what would lead there. Maybe for you, you're in college. Maybe it was when you were in college. You were trying to figure out, listen, how do I have fun in college and make good grades? Like, how do I do both of those things? Because I, I, I'm here at college, and I, I'm paying for an education, or mom and dad are paying for an education. If mom or dad are paying for it, you better get good grades. Anyway, that's just a side note, right? So you were in college, and you're like, listen, how do I have fun, and how do I get good grades? But it, like, you really didn't know the practices that led to that, and so here's what's happened. You have lots of fun, your grades go down, so then you have no fun, so your grades go back up, and you go through a four-year cycle of either having no fun and somewhat good grades, or you have good grades and no fun, and like, it's just this thing, and you couldn't figure it out. Maybe it's in your career, 
In your career, you have, a, you have a job that you love and you would like to move forward. You, you want to get promoted and you know that you should produce something and you know that there's always office politics. And so between what it is that you need to produce and the politics to move forward, you wish you knew what it took. And it seems like other people know how to get promoted, but you just don't know what it is that they're doing to get promoted ahead of you. Maybe you're married, and okay, this is free advice. Do not bump your spouse while I'm talking about this. That does not help, right? And so anyway, maybe you're married, and you're thinking, man, you know what? I would like to have a healthy, vibrant marriage where, like, where, like we can communicate clearly. We, we can conflict a, a resolution, and we can do that well, and we can communicate honestly, and, and there's romance, and we can do all those things while having children and a job and friends. And if you figure out how to do that, write a book, because you'll be a billionaire, <laughs> right? And we know what we, we, come on, come on, we're all laughing because we know what we want it to look like, but we sometimes don't know the practice. Lead that. Think about it. This comes true if you're a parent. Listen, every parent's dream is to raise a kid that you can say goodbye, right? <laughs> now, I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, you want to raise your kids so someday they'll leave the nest, they'll be successful, they'll launch, they'll go live their own life, and they'll do their thing, and they'll be set up well, and they'll be able to do those things. And so you want to raise your kid with, with love and with tenderness, but you also want to be firm and, and fair, and you also want to give discipline um, because you don't want them to be a brat, and you also want to be your friend. And, and when they left the hospital, no one gave you an instruction manual. Listen, I bet each and every one of us, whether you're watching or listening, We've all experienced this. We've all had an idea or a picture of what it is we wanted to look like, but we didn't have the practices that would lead to the results that we want. So when it comes to mad world, living sane, it leads me to our opening truth this morning. You can find it on the insert. It's going to be up here on the screen. What does it look like in practice to live sane in a mad world? What does it look like for us to actually practice? I mean, we know we want to live sane. Nobody leaves church. No one wakes up and goes, you know what? I want to add to the mad. I hope that I'm part of the craziness today. Most of us go, listen, I'm a mature adult. I'm a growing person. I would like to live sane in a crazy world. But what does it look like in practice? And so here's the truth. For many of us in this room, we don't want to add to the mad. And so we go, listen, I know that I want to live sane. But here's what happens. We get dragged into the madness. Not only do we get dragged into the madness, sometimes the madness surrounds us and, and we enter into that. And we're just like, how did I get dragged into this? How did I get pulled into the madness of the world around me? And sometimes I don't know how I ended up this. And I wish I knew how to live sane. And here's where we run into the problem. When you don't know what to do to get the results you want, you'll end up in a place you don't want to be. Let me say it again. If you know where you want to go, but you don't know how to get there, then you'll end up in a place you usually don't want to be because we'll get dragged, we'll get pulled. The chaos of the world will surround us and we'll actually be a part of the mad that we dislike. And so one of the important questions as we close out this series today is what practices, what can we actually do when we leave on Sundays, as we live Monday through Saturday, what practices lead to sane living? And this is why I say every Sunday, this is why I'm so fired up to be a follower of Jesus. It's great news today. God knew, and he didn't leave you and I guessing what practices would it look like to live sane. Matter of fact, all you have to do is look at the life of Jesus. Jesus is sane living in a mad world. And matter of fact, much of the New Testament is just kind of a reminder and an encouragement, instruction of what sane living looks like to people who live in a mad world. Matter of fact, we're going to take a look at this. The Apostle Paul lived in a world where the Roman Empire had dominated, where there was division and, and there was all kinds of things going on. And he, and he usually spoke to churches that were uh, ethnically divided and, and, and ethnically diverse. And there was the rich and the poor and the slave and the free. And there was the Jew and there was the Gentile. And there was all these different groups. And there was the madness of the world around them. And he was always speaking to them, how do you live sane? And we actually picked this up in a letter he writes in Colossians. We're going to put it up on the screen. It's going to be on the back of your insert if you can't read it. And it says, in this new life, and I just want to stop here and say this. Listen, um, if you're here, because I know in a group this size, we have some people who, who, who you know, um, have no faith. Some people have different faiths. People have some faith. And here, here's the great news is, is that God loves you and that human beings are separated by this thing called sin, which means we, we go our own way. And the new life that he's talking about is, is when you say yes to Jesus, which means you go, listen, I, I blew it. I, I messed up. 
Jesus, I need you to forgive me. Jesus, die on the cross for your sins. And then you say, listen, Jesus, I'm, I'm going to admit, and I'm going to change, and I'm going to become a follower of Jesus, and God sends his spirit. Your heart is refreshed. That is a new life. And he says, this new life, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. So here's what he's saying. He says, listen, it doesn't matter your ethnicity. Isn't that great news? It doesn't matter the color of your skin, the language you speak, the continent you're born on. It doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, which if you were a Gentile back in the day, could you imagine, hey, you got to join the faith and you have to have surgery? <laughs> right? So he says, well, whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised, and what he's really talking about is whether you have a bunch of religious rituals or no ritual, uh, rituals, whether you're barbaric, uncivilized, whether you're slave or free, Christ is, what's the word? Christ is all that matters, and he lives in? Now, see, here's the thing. Christ is all that matters, and he lives in all of us. And here's what he's trying to say. He says, listen, listen, listen. We have all this, these differences, all these diversities, but here's the great thing. And when we get together, we have something that is greater that unites us than divides us. Can I get an amen? We have something greater that unites us than divides us, and it is Christ, and he lives in all of us. So when you see someone who is different than you, that thinks different than you, that, you know, whatever it is, if they're a follower of Jesus, Christ lives in them too. But he doesn't just end there saying, you know what, just Christ is, you know, the head, that's something that unites us. Then he goes on, he says, listen, I want you to not forget what it looks like to live sane. And here's kind of the instruction he says, since God chose you to be holy people, and this word sometimes um, is kind of a weird word if you don't come from a church back. Holy just means kind of set apart to God, which means that you kind of belong to God. So he's basically saying, as people who belong to God. So as holy people, he loves you. And you must, and I like the word must, because it does, like this isn't, like this quick quick i'm gonna stop here i'm gonna go a little school's preaching okay see as when you're not a follower of jesus you get to do whatever you want now you'll get the consequences of that but if you're a follower of jesus not only is he your savior he's your lord so that means he doesn't give suggestions he gives commands aren't you excited you came to church today you what's the word okay so this is not optional you must clothe yourselves. So this isn't something God does for you. This is something you participate. You clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Now I want to stop right here. How different would our country be if followers of Jesus practiced those things right there? Tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness. And patience. I bet Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter would be a lot different if Christ followers did this. It'd be a lot different in our schools. It'd be a lot of different in our workplaces. It'd be a lot different in our communities. You must close, like, he's saying, if you want to know what sane living looks like, be tender heart of mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. That's, that's what it looks like. That's what sane living looks like and so here's what i thought i'd do today is i tell you well what does this look like what is tender-hearted mercy what is kindness humility gentleness and patience what does that look like in everyday life what does it look like when you and i leave here on from sunday whatever time it is whether it's you know after the nine o'clock service or after the eleven o'clock service or the ten thirty service love us whenever it is that you leave what does that look like in practice and so i really do i want to give you three brief things that Jesus modeled what this looks like in practice for you and I as we walk out the doors today and as we live Monday through Saturday. And here's, here's kind of the first observation that Jesus modeled for us, okay? Living sane means showing up, which requires us to leave our comfort zones. <laughs> Woo! Aren't you fired up? Living sane means showing up, which requires us to leave our comfort zones. And you might be going, Pastor Matt, how in the world is that biblical? Well, let, let's just look at the eyewitness account of the gospel. And these are Jesus' words. So you can take whatever you want with it. But here, here's Jesus. It says in Luke, for the Son of Man came to what? Okay, so seek and save the lost. Do you know what seeking means? 
It means you go to find. You see, the very word that we have, incarnation, which is a big fancy word, theological word for Jesus left the comfort and convenience of heaven where angels fell down and worshiped him. He put on a human suit and he came to a busted and broken world. He left what was comfortable and was abused and paid a horrible death on the cross. He showed up. So I want to go back to that. I want to go back to our, our first point, which is living sane means sh showing up. What, is it, what does it mean to show up? Now, listen, I used to be a part of an organization called Young Life. It's awesome. It reaches middle school and high school students. And if you're interested in that, you can go online and research that. But when I was on Young Life staff, I went to this uh, all-staff conference. And there were like a couple thousand Young Life leaders from all across the country. They gathered us all together. And we had this special speaker. His name was Dr. Howard Hendricks. He's a famous author. He taught at a pretty prestigious uh, seminary school, Dallas Theological Seminary, for 40 years. And he was speaking to all Young Life staff across the country. And every, every day he had like one talking message that he gave that kind of had one point. And what blew my mind is one of his points, listen, a professor for 40 years at a seminary who had written a bunch of books, who was a follower of Jesus, when he said, listen, I'm old, I'm getting ready to be retired. I have four things that I want to say to you. And one of them was, is you need to show up. And here's what he said. He says, you as a Christ follower need to be around some hells and dams. And the first thing they called me is he said, hell and damn to a bunch of Christians. And they called me by surprise. I said, I didn't know you were supposed to cuss. And I don't think he was trying to cuss, but he was trying to make a point. He said, listen, and, and he said it kind of differently, but he said, listen, when Christians choose, when Christians choose to stay in their holy huddle, they're just being cowards. See, when we just huddle with ourselves, with people that look like us, act like us, and believe like us, and that's all we ever do, it's really an act of cowardice. We choose to say to the heck with the world around us. And he says, Christ followers aren't supposed to do that. He said, Christ followers are supposed to be salt and light. I gave a whole message about that. He said, Christ followers are supposed to show up. And he said, listen, I taught in a seminary and I thought it was a cemetery. And he said, I need to be around some hex and some darns. And so he said, listen, I became a chaplain uh, of a professional football team because there were some wild and crazy dudes on there. And I enjoyed being around them because they were real people. And he says, I feel like God called me to show up. But it means we have to leave our comfort zone. I mean, it's so, isn't it so much easier? Isn't it so much easier just to be with people who are like us, think like us, believe like us? Go to, you know, come to a church where everyone looks like us. Come to a church where everyone votes like us. Come to a church where everyone agrees with everything that we say. All of our Facebook friends, we just, we're just preaching to the choir. Everywhere we go, it, it just people agree with us. We only, we only have friends who are like us. And we never, ever leave our comfort zone. Now, here's the great news. You say, listen, Matt, I'm a parent and I got a job and I, I coach soccer and I, you know, my life is busy. I can't go be a chaplain for a professional football team. How do I show up? And here's what I discovered. You don't have to show up by going anywhere. You just have to choose to be present wherever you go. Hold on. Me too. I, you, we just need to choose to be present wherever we go. I mean, Listen, have you ever been to Walmart? People are sad. I'm not, it's not funny. P people are sad. That they're, they're able to buy things and they show up there and they're angry. Like, we can be present. You can be present at Walmart. You can be present in your kids' play group. As you're cheering for your kids in the stand, you can be present with other parents. When you're in the restaurant, you can be present of the server and the people around you. You can be present in your neighborhood. The problem is, it's not that we don't want to show up. It's just that we just don't want to be present in the areas that we're in because we want to hide and avoid. Not, come on, now no one, now some of y'all are going to lie, but like, any, I used to be like this I, before I knew Jesus, I was a bad person. So I don't know if you ever went to like a kegger or to like a beer party or party where people did all kinds of crazy things. Maybe you never did. I, I, I did that, right? Okay. And you know what I notice about whenever you go to a party is people always have a cup. Because a cup or a beer or something is kind of like your protection. It's like your force field, right? Right? You have this thing and it identifies you with everyone else at the party because you got your red cup, right? You're just chilling. Oh, right, I got my red cup, right? And you can kind of walk around and if you want to talk to somebody, and if you don't want to talk to somebody, you take a sip. 
and then you walk away, right? And, but here's the thing. You know what? Most of us, we still do that. We just do it with our cell phone. Showing up is really just about being present. It's really that wherever we go, whether it's at work, whether it's in the hallways of your college or in the lunchroom of your high school or middle school, it's just being present. I remember Young Life, they taught me this one phrase that I'll never ever forget and I hope to teach you today. You know what showing up is? Showing up is when you walk into a room, instead of saying, here I am, you look around and go, there you are. Because that's what Jesus did. Showing up means wherever you go, whether it's Walmart or the soccer field or the lunchroom, you don't walk in and go, here I am, everyone just give me attention. No, you walk in and say, there you are. The world will never, ever be different until Christ followers choose to show up. When we choose to step out of our comfort zone, when's the last time that you had lunch and a meaningful conversation or a cup of coffee with someone who was a different race or someone who voted different or someone who thought different? Like, when's the last time you really sat down and just someone was different than you and you actually just showed up in their lives? Stepped out of your comfort zone. The world needs followers to show up. Well, what do we do when we show up? What if I don't know what to say? And here's the great news. You don't have to say anything. Matter of fact, the less you say, the better. <laughs> Which leads me straight in to practice number two. Because the practice number one is what? You just gotta, and that means to be present. To be present. Right? And here's the second one. Living sane, living sane makes us generous. What's the word? Generous listeners who choose to hear others. Again, not my idea. Straight from the Bible. Right, come on, listen, listen. Oh, God, this one's going to hurt. <laughs> it hurt me when I read it. Ready? James, we're going to put it up on the screen. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone, and who does everyone apply to? Okay, I just want to make sure everyone should be quick to... And slow to, man, do you know how different social media would be if, this, if we practice this? Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Matter of fact, you know what's amazing? I've read, I've read the Bible a bunch of times. Especially the New Testament. You know what's amazing is every time Jesus shows up and somebody wants to do something, wants him to do something, Jesus never assumes. Jesus always asks a Jesus always starts off with, what is it that you want me to do? Jesus always first act is to listen. He engages someone with a question and says, what is it that you want me to do for you? We should be generous listeners. Famous author and psychologist, Dr. Henry Cloud, said one of the basic human needs outside of clothes, food, and shelter is to be known and to be understood. At the core of every human being is they want someone to know them and they want someone to understand them. That every human being wants that. And you know how you know someone and then you understand them? It's not from talking, it's by what if Christ followers became a community of listeners? As I was thinking about this and doing some research, I came across an interesting story. Um, his name is Benjamin Mathis. He started this thing called Urban Confessions. Um, you can look it up later. But anyway, he was, he was out and about in, I think, Los Angeles, actually. Um, and he said um, someone came up to him, um, uh, you know, a kind of a poor, disenfranchised person, came up to him and said, hey, um, could, could you give me some money? And he had zero cash on him. He said, listen, I'm so sorry. And he was getting ready to kind of just say, I'm sorry, and then walk away. And then he had this thought. He said, listen, he, he looked at the person and said, listen, I don't have any cash, but could I sit with you? And I'd love to hear your story. And so he sat with this person and heard his story. And the bond and the connection he had with this person did something to his heart and his soul. And so he, he realized, he said, I think that person was more impacted by me listening than me giving them a five or a ten. 
So he said, listen, he, he had this brilliant idea. He said, I'm going to, he got a piece of cardboard and he wrote free listening. And he said, I'm going to go stand out in Los Angeles with a card that says free listening. And he thought, there's no way anyone is going to come up and talk to me. And he put free listening. And he said he was stunned at the number of people who would come up and just start sharing their hurts and their pains and who they were. Because at the core of every human being is they want to be known and they want to be understood. And the only way to be known and to be understood is for someone to... Matter of fact, if I was really honest, one of the greatest acts of love that you can ever give someone is to authentically, deeply listen to them. It's amazing. Everyone should be quick to listen. I love what it says a little bit later in Colossians. We're going to put it up here. It says, live wisely among those who are not believers. Man, wouldn't it be great if like, as we interacted with people, we lived wisely among those who maybe didn't know the name of Jesus, like, and make most, uh, make most of every opportunity. And then it goes on to say, let your conversations be, I just want to ask a real quick question. In the last month, how have your conversations been? Have they been gracious and attractive so that you'll have the right response for everyone? Here's what I've discovered. No one wants to hear what you have to say to you willing to listen to them. And here's the problem. Here's the problem. And I'm just, just going to be really honest. I usually don't listen to hear. I listen to respond. And I'm just wondering, is, is, that, is that anyone else? That we don't really listen to hear and to know and to understand. We listen to people so that we can tell them what we think. So that we can have a response. But here's the thing. When we listen only to respond, it is, being, it is the most selfish act because we are basically ignoring the other person. Saying, I could care two hoots about what you think or feel. I don't, I'm not interested in understanding you. I just want to communicate what's important to me because life's all about me. Here I am instead of there you are. Just be a generous listener. I promise you. Do this and see if, see if you don't discover something. Whether you're in the grocery store or Walmart or Target or you're at a restaurant, ask someone, hey, how's your day? I see that you're smiling. Is life good? Or go, hey, you look a little bit bummed. How's life? And I bet if you look them in the eye and you act interested, you'll be surprised at the number of people who start pouring their lives out to you. Are we a generous listener? Which leads me to observation number three, which is we can put into practice is uh, sane living is displayed through acts of generosity and kindness to others, regardless of our disagreements and differences. Now, this is going to be a tough one. This is going to be, this is what is really hard for followers of Jesus to do. Like, this is going to be the, this is going to be really unpopular, okay? I just wanted you to know. You're not going to like this. But here's the great news. This doesn't come from me. It comes from Jesus. Living sane is displayed by acts of generosity and kindness to others, regardless of our disagreement and differences. Which means when we don't like someone or someone doesn't like us, we don't repay evil for evil. We overcome evil with... Okay, now listen, that's not my idea. This is what Jesus says. We're going to pick it up on the eyewitness account. We're going to put it up here on the screen. You have heard it. It says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But, and then he goes on to say, but I tell you. So Jesus is saying, you've heard that, but here's what I'm telling you. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that may you be children of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Jesus, what effort does it take to love people that love you? If you only hang around people who are like you, think like you, act like you, vote like you, uh, agree with what you want to do, well, of course they're going to love you, and of course you're going to love them, because inherently it's selfish. It's kind of an economic thing where I like you, and you like me, and we get it back, and we're all good. He says, what reward do you get? Are not even the text collectors doing that? He's saying that's what's wrong with the world. People only love people that are like them or that are nice to them. He says living sane means that you are, have, give acts of generosity and kindness re, despite the disagreements and differences. 
I'll never forget, I had a good friend, his name was Fletcher. Fletcher was a big dude. Fletcher is about six foot one, about 300 pounds. He did Young Life in inner city DC. Um, and I remember one time I was, I was in a car with Fletcher and uh, the conversation got on something that um, you shouldn't talk about in a car full of people. And I remember I said one of the stupidest things I've ever said to someone I consider my friend. I turned to my friend Fletcher and I said, Fletcher, how can you think that way and be a follower of Jesus? Well, that, that was just so wise and so Christ-like. I'm like, what is wrong with you, man? And I went on to explain why I thought what I thought. And then he went on to explain what he, he thought. And I was just a jerk. I, I just was unwilling to listen. I was kind of rooted in an opinion that I think is wrong. And I just said, I don't, see, I don't understand how you, like, how you could think that way. And, and he said, well, could you, would you be willing to listen? And I didn't. I wasn't listening to hear. I was listening to respond. And uh, Fletcher and I would play basketball often when we were at Young Life gigs. And, and I, I'm also a bad follower of Jesus when I play sports. That's why I don't play him anymore. And I remember one time I came through the lane and I, I tried to bohog my friend, you know, elbow him and move him around. And he didn't move, you know, 150 pounds of me against my 300 pound friend, right? And he said, hey, man, you might want to settle down. And he said it was such a smile, I realized that he could have crushed me and squashed me. And because he was my friend, he didn't repay evil for evil. Fletcher was kind and he was generous. And he was kind to me when I was a jerk to him. He was a friend when I, I wasn't always friendly towards him. And it changed my heart. And I discovered sane living isn't just doing good to those who do good to you. It's when you are generous and kind to those who are different. To those you may disagree with. We're called to love our enemies. I wonder if we, I wonder if we do that. Wouldn't it be awesome? Instead of being known for what we're against, people just go, man, those Jesus people, they love people well. It's not my idea, it's what Jesus says, I mean, acts of kindness. You know what the world needs? The world does not need more anger. The world doesn't need more self-righteousness. The world doesn't need another group of people who think they're right. What the world needs is people who will display the love of God in a busted and broken world and who will be kind to people. If I had to sum up Mad world, living the same, it, 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 it'd be this. It would be obeying Jesus. Obeying Jesus means I love people on the outside with the love of God I have on the inside. See, we can't just say I know Jesus and I love Jesus, but not obey Jesus. You can do that, but that, that makes us hypocrites. Is that, is, that fair? Is, that a fair, is that a fair statement? We can't say I love Jesus, I know Jesus, but I'm not going to obey Jesus. Because if you don't obey Jesus, then you're not a Jesus follower. You're just a fan of Jesus. You know about Jesus, but you're not a follower of Jesus. You become a follower of Jesus when we obey Jesus. And Jesus made it, I mean, here's the great thing. I had to speak on inner varsity this past week. And I said, listen, it's really simple. Jesus comes and demystifies religion. He says, listen, obeying me means loving people on the outside with the love of God that you have on the inside. There's no way a Christ follower can go, I'm right with God this way, but I can treat my neighbor any way I want this way. Jesus says, that's, that's wrong. My timer tells me that my time is up. So I want to close with a story. If you're, if you're a long time attender and you've been here for a while at South Point, you've probably heard of my friend Marvin Jones. But I think showing up, listening, and acts of kindness can change a life. My mom had committed suicide. My, my dad had taken me to the police station. At the time, I was 12 and a half years old. I was one of the youngest people to ever be admitted into Fairfax County Detention Center at the time. And there was a guard there, and his name was Marvin Jones. Marvin was a black man. He was an older black man. And he had experienced a lot of, of racism growing up in, in our country. And what was amazing about Marvin, as you would think, there's very little opportunity to show up in a detention center, right? Because you're really not allowed to share your faith. You're really not allowed to, like, you know, do stuff. And plus the people in the detention center, they're probably busted and broken. I mean, they're probably the people, like, you know, if you're going to share Jesus, they'd be the least likely to take it. But you know what? Every time Marvin was on shift, he didn't just arrive and hide. He was present. 
I, I, listen, as a 12-year-old, I was astute enough to know that there were some guys there cashing a paycheck. They didn't give two hoots about me. They were to get there, there they were to make sure I stayed in my cell and I behaved, and they were getting a paycheck. But Marvin, there was something different. He seemed to be present and alive when he showed up. And I'll never forget, every time I went down on lockdown, which is where they put you in isolation for being a knucklehead, which unfortunately I, happened a lot to me. And when Marvin was on shift, he would often come in and he would sit and talk to me and was just, it boggled me. Why would, why would he listen to me? And he would look me in the eye and we have compassion. And he was kind to me. And in a few moments, he would share as much about Jesus that he could within the confines of the law. You're special. God cares. There's a God who loves you, a God who made you. He wants to be your friend. I didn't become a Christ follower there. But 10 years later, a decade later, I was at a Young Life event. And I was talking to someone. They didn't know me. And they asked me to share the story, so to share my story. And behind me, someone with a cowboy hat, I, I didn't recognize the person because they were facing the other way, but I was telling my story. And this person with this cowboy hat turns around and says, Fairfax County Detention Center, you were 12, are, are you Matt Hall? And I turned around and looked, and there is Marvin Jones. I had become a Christ follower. And so, so here's my question. If we want to practice what sane living is so that we don't get dragged in, so don't we get kind of scooped into the madness of the world, here's three practices. Be present and show up. Be a generous listener and have ran our acts or regular acts of kindness and generosity to those who are different. Because I believe if we, I mean, think about how different our communities would be. Think about how different our world would be if every person left here and practiced those things every day this week, how different our community would be. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you, God, that Jesus demonstrated that Jesus left the comfort of heaven to show up in a busted and broken world so that we would know that you love us. May we leave our, our comfort zones, our holy huddles, so the world knows that you love them. God, thank you that Jesus was a generous listener. He always asked, what is it that you want? He listened to people's hearts and their stories. God, may we listen not to respond, but may we listen to hear. God, may we not only love and be kind and generous to people who are like us or who are in our circles, but may we be kind and generous the way you are to those of us that say two hoots to you. How you make the sun to shine and the rain to fall on both the good and the bad. If we only love people like us, what different are we? God, may we obey the words of Jesus. May the love of God that's on the inside, may we practice that to our neighbor on the outside. This is our hope and our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're ready to take the next step in your spiritual journey or continue to support South Point, you can connect to a small group, serve on a team, and give financially by clicking the box on the right. To watch other sermons from South Point Church, click the playlist on the left. Click the logo to subscribe.